coaching astrophotography. We cover all kinds of topics, everything from beginner topics to really advanced stuff. Uh, everything from, uh, we've had some guest speakers, we have some of our world-class photographers that come and show their stuff. Uh, we have our show and tell. So it's a great time, a lot of fun, so I hope that you can join us. But tonight we're going to be talking about urban astrophotography, or photography that you can do from right here in Dallas. And I want you to know we did scour the Metroplex for the best astrophotographers out there that were available on a Friday night between 7 o'clock and 9 o'clock. <laughs> We've got lined up for you. Uh, now these guys are great. They've done fantastic work, and I think you're going to leave here inspired to go out and try some of this stuff and really see some of the amazing things that you can do even from within the city. Uh, but what I wanted to do tonight to start off, and I, I know what you're thinking, I wish he would do a top ten list. So I have to disappoint you. I have a top five list. So we'll go through the top five reasons that you can't get to a dark site to take pictures. Number one, you saw a tornado on the Atoka webcam. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe it's not a great day to go up there. Uh, your spouse says you have to stay home and clean the garage that's full of your telescope stuff. Uh, there's a wildfire between here at Comanche Springs. They can't make it out to CSAC. <laughs> And all the dust in western Oklahoma has now blown over into eastern Oklahoma. <laughs> and then the number one reason is because you probably have to sell all of your astro gear to earn pay for gas to get up. <laughs> so never fear. You know, you, you think that if you can't get to a dark site, that you can't take great astro photos. Well, that's really not true. You know, you, you might imagine that if you take these, these things from within the city, they're going to be washed out, overexposed. Nothing's, nothing's going to come out. But that's not true. Let me show you a few examples. Uh, here we have M81 and M82. You can kind of see... Uh, <laughs> 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 Uh, of course, you have uh, the nice Markarian chain in Virgo, <laughs> really nice locality <laughs> there. And then uh, everybody's favorite M42. <laughs> <laughs> so there's no problem in doing astrophotography from the city. Well, actually, there are ways you can get great photographs even from here and down. And we're going to show you uh, some techniques and some objects that you can take pictures of. And, and go for it and get great, great images, post on your website, share with your friends, and amaze your family. So what we'll do now is we'll start off with uh, Phil Jones, and he's going to show us a little bit about using narrow band filters to do deep sky imaging. with each other. We like helping each other out. I love mentoring so many kids that started. 
Um, I remember when, when Dave was first getting into this and he was emailing me questions, that kind of thing. And now I, I love seeing it when somebody's really stuck with it and their, their stuff is just incredible to, to look at. So, narrow band imaging, yeah, they looked up there. Oh, yeah, I forgot. So, narrow band imaging is, um, you've probably seen the Hubble images, and those are the most famous narrow band images where uh, you see a, kind of a color scheme similar to this of nebula structure. Um, unfortunately, you know, the, I mean, the, the Hubble will be zoomed in on like this part here, right? Um, so, I, I can't get that kind of magnification, but what's neat is, is the, the narrow band imaging, and so you all understand, those two nebula structures are red, okay? That's not their normal color, and that's what narrow band is doing, is showing the nebula structure in a different color scheme, and you're going to understand why in a minute here. Uh, so what you do is you use these filters, and you have a monochrome CC camera, that means it's a black and white camera chip, okay? And you're shooting your image data, your object, I'm sorry, through those filters, and then you're going to combine those images to get this kind of result. And the filters are called hydrogen alpha, oxygen, and sulfur. Okay? Here is my filter wheel, and I have seven filters. I have a regular luminous filter for normal black and white images. I have a red filter, a green filter, and a blue filter. And with those four filters, I will normally, I'll take natural color images, meaning you're seeing the object as it really is in true color. But I have three more filters, and they're the, those are my narrow band filters. <coughs> Sometimes narrow band photography is called uh, mapped, uh, mapped color, okay? Because what you're doing, and this is, a, this is a screenshot from Photoshop, is what you're doing is you're assigning each of those uh, filters to the red, green, or blue channel. All right. So what I'm doing here is you see it's an RGB image, but it's not really RGB. Uh, I'm mapping the sulfur data. This, and, and let me explain what I mean when I say data. Okay. So when I'm taking a picture through the sulfur filter, I'll take five or six. 10 minute, 15 minute exposures, and then I stack them. So I have a master sulfur photo. I'll do the same thing with the hydrogen alpha, the same thing with the oxygen. Now I've got three master files representing those three spectrums, and now I'm going to map them. I'm basically just, you, you see the little dashed line around the edge of the frame, the, the photo? That means I've done control A for all. I'm selecting it, and then I just paste it. So I'm pasting the sulfur into the red. I'll paste the H out from the green and the oxygen into the blue, and the next result is, you know, by selecting the RGB on top, you get that color scheme. Does that make sense? That nebula is really red, but what I've done is I've identified its chemical makeup through those spectrum filters. Uh, this is an example of uh, a nebula that is suffocating because it has no oxygen. Uh, what what's going on here is this is an object that can only be picked up with two of those narrow band filters. Uh, this is an object that's not fully understood because it's getting light from that that star. It's getting ionization from that star, but it's it's not a fully emission nebula. It's partly reflection, so the oxygen doesn't pick up. Hydrogen alpha filter. Uh, by itself is a great filter. You don't have to have all three filters. You can produce beautiful black and white images with just the hydrogen alpha filter. Uh, another thing that's nice about the hydrogen alpha filter, and I gotta tell y'all, uh, these narrow band filters are, are not, they're not in the same price range as the RGB filters. They're, they're a lot more expensive. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I remember for my 40th birthday, my wife got me uh, the sulfur filter. I told her I wanted to get a narrow band so she presented me with a sulfur filter, you know, and I was like, well, thanks, I need two more. <laughs> thanks, babe, you know. So, um, anyway, uh, but the hydrogen alpha filter, I, I know a guy who's, whose work is absolutely stunning, and he does not have, one, one of the things you learn is about 
shooting photography through a refractor is there are two kinds of refractors. There's what's called an achromat, and there's what's called an apochromat. And there are two differences. One is one does proper color correction, and one doesn't. One is very, 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 very expensive, one is not. So the, the one you want, you want good color correction when you're shooting your normal color images because you want your red, green, and blue to rival in the camera chip at the exact same point, and that's what color correction does. Well, with the hydrogen alpha filter, you don't need a color correcting refractor. You can actually image with an acromat and get a very sharp contrasting image. So it's an affordable way to, to image as far as the scope goes. So did you shoot any of these from uh, Dallas? Not that one. The, uh, the hydrogen out the California nebula there, I believe I did shoot that from Dallas. And I should have written that down, which one's I shot from where. This I did shoot from Dallas. This is the Eagle and the um, Swan. Thank you, Swan. Swan. I know how to take pictures, I just don't know the object. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and what's neat about this image is you can see the nebula structure connecting the, the two objects there. So these are all done with hydrogen alpha images. And so it, what I'm, my point is you can take artistic pretty pictures. It, it, that's really fascinating. You can also use your hydrogen alpha filter to provide you a nice contrasty luminous data when you're when you take RGB filter uh, I'm sorry when you shoot for RGB filters and take normal natural color images you combine a luminous to provide the detail. The RGB filters are providing the color the black and white is providing the detail. So you can use hydrogen alpha on an emission nebula uh, to, to provide that, that detail. <coughs> you can also use it to dim the moon. Uh, my because my CCD camera is dedicated for astrophotography, and you need the chip is very sensitive, the moon is too bright for it. On the night of the uh, perigee moon, um, it was really bright. And normally I'd, I'd use my H alpha filter in the past, and on this part for June and I, even my H alpha filter was, uh, was didn't dim the moon enough. I, I found that I could only use the sulfur filter. The narrow band filters have what's called a narrow band path, meaning the filters reduce the amount of light allowed to pass through. The light spectrum is measured in nanometers. Uh, the narrow band path makes these filters ideal for urban imaging. And here's why. So on, on the left, you see what's a normal RGB filters, okay? And they're very broad in the blue, green, and red spectrums, okay? But then when you look at the narrow band filters, you realize they're very narrow in, how, in what, how much light they let through. Well, the nice thing about that is light pollution doesn't come through as, as easily through those filters. So it makes it ideal. It's the same thing with moonlight. Um, the oxygen filter will pick up some moonlight. So <coughs> on, a, on a night that you've got the moon up, you can shoot through your other two filters and wait for the moon sun around to shoot the oxygen. <coughs> uh, but they rule out the light pollution pretty good. Uh, my sulfur filter, for some reason, the city of Frisco, where I live, uh, has, um, I need to talk to the city manager about changing the tone of the, the lights because my sulfur filter picks up the, the light pollution a little bit there. Um, or I can, I, and, and I'm going to talk about this in a minute, um, those filters, you can actually buy even narrower band filters, okay? And we'll talk about that in a minute oh, on this slide, as a matter of fact. So, I went to a great website to go to, which, by the way, is on this slide here. At the bottom, it says starazona.com. Uh, that's a astronomy store in Tucson. If you're ever in Tucson, you've got to stop there. It's, 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 I, my wife had to drag me out of the store. Um, <laughs> but their website is fabulous. It's got so much information. If you want to get an astrophotography, I recommend going to their website and reading their information. So they have a whole section just on narrow band imaging. And I can just like all this diagram from them. And then these are definitions, these in the, in the yellow are definitions from them, explaining what the three filters are doing. So, you know, hydrogen alpha is the most dominant emission line in a star forming region, such as the Rhine Nebula. And, and um, this light is created by atomic hydrogen. 
Uh, oxygen, this line is given off by doubly ionized oxygen atoms, and it's in the blue-green portion of the spectrum. And then sulfur, uh, singly ionized sulfur emits light in the deep red part of the spectrum. I need to memorize that because that would sound more intelligent. <laughs> um, but there at the bottom, so these filters, uh, they come in, in different, what I call band pass flavors. And so the 10 nan nanometer is going to be a little bit broader. Uh, there's, um, I think, Bader, B A A D E R, sell a set of uh, narrow band filters in the in 10, you know, like one is 10 nanometer, one's 12, one's 13, somewhere in that range. Those are going to be okay in, in an urban setting. They're not going to block out as much light. Uh, six nanometer, I used to own a set of those, those did pretty good. I now own five nanometer. Uh, I would have to sell a kid to buy the three and a half nanometer. Because <laughs> <laughs> as you can imagine, the price actually goes up as you go to the right. Um, there are some guys with three and a half nanometer filters shooting in New York, you know, uh, and in California in your you know, suburban skies and getting incredible images. But those filters, and, and, and also, the bigger the camera chip, the bigger the filter you need. The bigger the filter, the more the, the cost goes up. <laughs> so, I have shot this object, and I'm on my third set of narrow band filters, by the way. I have shot this object through three different, with three different cameras, three different sets and brands of filters, <coughs> nanometers, and um, three different telescopes. So the, notice the two on the left look similar, um, and then the one on the right doesn't look very much, you know, it's missing some color. It's because I sold my telescope before I was able to finish the object. Um, I, I didn't get all of the oxygen data for it. But it turned out kind of interesting, so I went ahead and ran with it. I, I thought it was kind of neat. Um, but anyway, so the, the bubble nebula is a popular object to, to photograph because when you do the the other reason I post this up here is when you do narrow band, uh, the bubble kind of gives more of a 3D effect. Because again, this is a red nebula. And when you see it in red, the nebula structure doesn't stand out as much. Some techniques and tips. When imaging, it is usually best to expose 10 to 30% longer in the oxygen and sulfur spectrum than in the HA. Uh, narrow band imaging requires a steady mount. Brett. Uh, that can handle long guided exposures, <laughs> typically over 10 minutes. If y'all were here the last time we gave a presentation, I bashed breast mail, so I had to bring that up. Um, target objects. So this is kind of important. You're thinking, okay, if I bought some uh, narrow band filters, great, I'll go photograph the triangulum galaxy. Well, guess what? You'll pick up all the emission nebula structure in the gap galactic arms. That's about it. Um, the the uh, filters are only really good on emission nebula and planetary nebula, and here's why. The chemical makeup, the ionization that goes on there is, is such that they, and, and again, I recommend you go to the star zone site because it, it, if you want to understand more at the scientific level what's going on, why are these photons produced. So an emission nebula, the difference between emission nebula and reflection nebula is this. An emission nebula, the chemical makeup of the gas, is such that it emits its own light. Whereas a reflection nebula, you only see it because there are either stars in it or behind it, somehow shining on it. There. So a reflection nebula doesn't emit its own light, emission nebula does. Planetary nebula also emit their own light. So the, the emission and the planetary nebula are the only objects that you can really use, other than I showed you the moon, uh, that you can really use no band filters on. Okay. Uh, so in other words, if you if, if you take your narrow band filters and you aim your scope at Pleiades, you're only going to pick up the stars. You're not going to pick up the reflection nebula. Uh, contrary to what some people will claim online, there is no aesthetic standard for narrow band imaging. I say that because if you do go on some of the forums and discussion groups, uh, there's a guy out there who's very active in the groups. He claims he pioneered narrow band imaging and he set the standard. Well, guess what? When you're shooting RGB, you're shooting the natural color of the object, right? So that is the standard. <coughs> if your nebula came out purple instead of red, the problem is you. 
okay? But with narrow band, and you saw my yellow bubble, maybe, I think I'm the only person who's ever produced a yellow bubble nebula image. But there is no setting standard, and that's what's neat. And I, sh I showed you this, how you map the, the HA, oxygen, and sulfur to the three colors. You don't have to do it that way. That's, that's called the Hubble palette. That's how NASA does. You can, there are other palettes. You, you can move things around. You can double up on one filter, you know, that kind of thing. You can get creative. Um, and lastly, when someone says narrowband images are false color, you can demonstrate your higher intellect by correcting them with, actually, there's a spectrum band color which quite accurately details the nebulous ionization structure. <laughs> it sounds highly intelligent. So. We need to buy hard drives. Mm -hmm. yeah, we're, we're, yeah, we're, we need to be able to buy hard drives. It should become peaceful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you gotta wear a lab coat with that. Yeah. All right. Any questions? Yes. I noticed on one of the, uh, the first slides you had, the star is on it. It looks like there's an H and beta filter. Yes, there is. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, I already killed this. But okay. So the H beta H beta filter is. Um, not, there are some people who have tried to use it in imaging, but it's apparently so deep in the blue spectrum that it doesn't produce much data. It's really a visual. Yeah. There, there is a, actually some visual use, some very limited objects you can use. Well, of course, they have California that we are a couple of them. Yes, sir. There are hydrogen alpha filters at somewhere around 653 nanometers. They sent some little sheet with diagram with numbers on it. <laughs> <laughs> Given that sulfur two is so close to HA, are there anywhere that bandwidth is wide enough where you get both in the same filter? Or do you buy them individually, even though they're only a little bit apart? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. Sorry. He, he was playing stump the chunk tonight. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, sir. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. What are you using for a CCD? Well, I have two cameras. I have um, an Apple GU16M, which is a medium format uh, chip. Uh, and then I have a QHY8, which is the 8300 chip. Any other questions? Yes, sir. <coughs> When you were talking about stacking the images, you also alluded to the fact that there was sometimes a time difference, even a telescope difference. Can you stack images from different times, different telescopes? Okay, so in, 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 um, in just in general practice, there are some objects you actually want to do that with. For example, uh, Andy, who won't stop taking pictures of me, um, <laughs> was showing me his Orion image that he shot at Tech Star Party, and he uh, was, you know, he was talking about, okay, so the core is burned out. Well, Ryan Nebula is one of those objects you actually need to take pictures of three different durations. And then you later bring in your core, because your core is so bright where that star birthing region is in Orion, you, you only want to take like five second shots, then 20 second shots. And then you take your Ryan, normal Ryan pictures, and then later you, you combine them so that you see the detail of the core. Otherwise, it's just bright white. So, so when you stack them, how do you make sure they're aligned? Well, the software, there's very stacking software you can use, and it comes with the star alignment uh, routine that you do. Oh. And there's various ones you can do it manually, you can do it automatically. Uh, so there are, there are programs that do that. And come to Apple City, we'll tell you all about it. Oh, really? so, who all went to TSP last week? Y'all owe me. <laughs> Y'all owe me. I didn't go, and you had clear skies every night. Yeah. Yeah. I was not there. The food was better. Yeah. No, yeah. I wasn't there. Now, I heard, were there was the vegetables still frozen vegetables? No. Mm -hmm. And we were really glad about that. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody have a chili pie? Bill. Yeah, next, if y'all see John Davis, who uh, had chili pie a couple years ago, see us. Freedom yeah. pie. Yeah. Freedom pie. Ask Freedom him about pie. it. They, they had pulled pork burritos this time. Oh, yeah, they were good. Oh. All right. Thanks, Bill. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, about the, the, the neuroband interview. <laughs>
filters, but even though they're they're expensive, that you know they can if you factor in the cost of gas, driving out to the site and, and travel time, wear and tear on the car, you know maybe you can make your, uh, your business case for. <laughs> so, Good luck. Would, would, um, you, would you say that again so I could report it? <laughs> yeah, uh, I think it's being reported on priority. Yeah. 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 I think so. All right. Well, let's move on. So we've got uh, Brett Dahl with us now, who is going to talk to us a little bit about planetary imaging. Another great type of object and, and imaging technique that you can use again right here. Hey, Brett. All right, the, uh, the solar system is kind of a completely different realm of imaging than what Phil talked about. Uh, and why the solar system is all the objects are bright. Um, Hi, Brett, let me get you to put this on so that I hear it.
if the atmosphere is turbulent, you're not going to get a good image. But if it is smooth and that you have nice laminar uh, sky, you can actually get turbulence inside your telescope. And what I have a picture of up there is my telescope with a cooler in it. If your telescope is not at the atmospheric temperature, you're going to get thermal currents inside your telescope, and it's going to degrade your image no matter how steady the skies are. So what I typically do, I'll set my telescope out uh, two or three hours before I want an image, and if that's not possible, I'll set it out and stick my fan in there. All it is is a little PC fan uh, with a filter so I don't blow the dust and dirt inside my telescope, and that helps cool it down pretty quickly. And uh, what it is, it's a, it's a tube about this far that goes through the baffle and then will blow air back onto the mirror. <coughs> and so it will cool it down really in a matter of 20 or 30 minutes while I'm setting up the rest of my gear. I'll put that up there and I'll be ready to go by the time it goes off. What kind of filter? I actually got like a filtry, one of the uh, HEPA filters you put in your air conditioning. I just cut it out and put it in there. Actually, my animation isn't working. Well, what I have here, I had kind of a, a, it was kind of a chance encounter. I was imaging Jupiter, and a jet passed right in front of it, and you could see the jet wash and what it did to the atmosphere. Um, I have a actual video that I'll pull up later that will kind of display the scene, but. Uh, you can just imagine if jet wash does it, if you have multiple inversion layers of temperature in the atmosphere, it'll do the exact same thing. Well, this is my best slide at all. There you go. And this is another example here. These are images of Jupiter that I took on the same night, only 20 minutes apart, with the same focus, the same. Uh, same focus, same magnification, the same uh, processing. And as you can see, the top one, there's not as much detail. But if you look at the bottom one, you can see a lot more uh, differences in the clouds. You can see storms. You can see uh, some more banding. But it seeing makes a huge difference. But don't let that discourage you, especially if you're getting started. Just drag your equipment out there and just try to image because there's a whole lot of other intricacies that you have to learn to get good images. Like I said earlier, these, these uh, targets are small. If you, if you think about it, you're looking almost like at a star point that you're trying to image. And you have to have focal length of these. I've seen people take pretty good images with refractors, uh, maybe a six inch, but <coughs> you lose a lot of detail. You can't get lot of the detail structure in the rings of Saturn or the clouds of Jupiter. So you need focal lengths and you need <coughs> I image with a 10 inch telescope. I've seen guys put out some pretty good pictures with an 8 inch and just as you step down you get less and less detail. Uh, I know some people in the club they have 16, 12 inch telescopes that they image with. And so the more aperture you get and the longer focal length you're going to get a better image. Uh, could you turn up the volume so we can hear the hearing Try to stay next to the microphone. Get through this one here? Yeah. Okay. And just to give you an idea of scale, the uh, sun is about a half a degree in the sky, so is the moon. Uh, those are fairly wide field objects, if you haven't seen them for this. Narrow filter or narrow objects, we got Mars that varies between 5 and 25. Arc minutes, you got Venus that goes from 15 to 40 seconds. Second. 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 Sorry. <laughs> Second. Yeah, minutes would be. God, that'd be if we had a reason, we'd be running for the hill. Yeah. 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 Then Mars on the way to 2003 would come back early. You know, Jupiter's 40 and then Saturn is 20. Uh, Jupiter and Saturn are fairly constant. Uh, uh, they're distant for us anyway. Mars. With this elliptical orbit and it's very uh, closeness to the Earth, you know, it's very, very big anyway. And so the trick is one of the tricks for me was actually finding this on the chip. These planetary cameras, the chip on them might only be a quarter of an inch wide. 
And so you're magnifying a picture of a plant at 150 to 300 eggs in some cases. And getting that plant right on that chip was really difficult. And I actually <coughs> have a question for Phil. Do you know what that is in the ice in the uh, holder in the upper left? Uh, yeah, because I host the public observing event, I do have ice. Okay, <laughs> that was going to be the bonus question that you own an ice ball. I actually find it visually centered in the uh, field of view, and then I know that it's in the center of my, my field, and then I'll put the camera on. This is a picture of the camera here, and I just center it there again because it will be off slightly from the eyepiece. And then I'll step up the magnification by putting it in a bar low. Let me see if I can. Can you shoot to the diagonal? No, actually, I just put those in there. It, the camera kind of got hidden behind it in the picture, so I just put it in there to show you a little bit better. Okay, so you've got your telescope out, it's a nice night, you've got the, uh, your scope, the thermal equilibrium, you've got the image on the, on the sensor itself, now you've got to focus it. There's several different methods that people use to, to focus, and one of the basic ones is just eyeball it. Uh, one of the ways that I found out that I needed glasses was I was taking pictures and my wife was like, I'm to focus. I was like, no, that's perfect. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's one thing that you need to watch out for. But just cycle through it. You can take, get it as close to focus as you think, uh, as close as you can, then back off just a little bit, and then step it forward. And you might just throw away some data at the end of the night, but you should have some data that you can use. Uh, the second way, and one that I like to use, especially on Jupiter and Saturn, is use the moon. Uh, these are all the moons around Saturn, and you can see Io here for Jupiter. If those are small enough, they should be pretty much little pinpoints. Um, just use those, just kind of <coughs> gain way up on your camera, and it will get you pretty close to focus. Another way is the Hartman map. I don't know if anybody has ever used one of these, but basically it's a big cover you put over the end of your telescope, and it has holes cut out on it, and you can... Uh, and as you cycle through the focus, with those holes cut out in the mask, you'll actually get three distinct images of the planet. And that's what you can see up here. Uh, and as you come closer and closer to focus, those images will converge into one. And whenever you got one image, you're in focus. So as you watch this here, I'll, I'll be coming, coming into focus, and you'll see the, uh, the detail of the planet pop out. There's just three holes there? Yeah, there's just three holes. There's, there's all sorts of versions of these. Uh, there's some with, I forget the name of it now, I'm sure some of them call it. Oh, that's 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 yeah. that, and it just gives you a star pattern whenever you, you see it. Plus, you can make those yourself. 
Actually, the one I that I made myself. I'm too cheap to go pay for one. Right? I just got a piece of plastic and use a uh, drill to drill down. And you can also use software. There's software programs out there that'll help you focus. Uh, I actually haven't done that on planetary yet, but I know some people that use it. <coughs> Okay, now that you're in, got the planet in focus, you have to capture it. And one of the tricky things with planetary imaging is everybody is spinning. We're spinning, the planet you're imaging is spinning. Uh, whereas deep sky objects don't change over time, like Phil was saying, you stack multiple images over multiple nights, over years, you get the same data as planets, you can't do it. You're limited to just a couple of minute window before the planet rotates and changes. And if you try to stack the images, you're not going to get a good result. So you need to limit your exposures to, at the most, four minutes maybe for Saturn, because it's, there's not a whole lot of surface detail on the clouds. Jupiter, its day is about 10 hours, so you need to limit it to just a couple of minutes for Jupiter. Mars, its day is 24 hours, so it's similar to us. You can get away with, you know, four minutes, somewhere around there. So you just need to limit it. Once you take a video file, that's it for that video that picture, you'll move on to the next one after that. There's lots of software you can use too. There's lots of freeware programs out there. I actually got hooked on Iris whenever I started this about 2004. It's actually in French. The, all the menus are in French, but it's really intuitive. I mean, you don't even have to know French to get around it, but the guy who <laughs> did it really well. The uh, manual is in English. Huh? The manual is in English. No, it's, <laughs> it's, it's just that intuitive. Uh, you can also get, there's another popular one, K3CCD tools. This guy's actually charging for this now, but he has a lot of tools in there, histograms and, and whatnot to help you with your image. And then there's a lot of camera specific imaging source cameras that I use. They come with their own imaging capture uh, software. And all you have to really have is the control over your, your frame rate, your uh, gain, your gamma, and uh, your exposure. So that Philips uh, camera you mentioned, does it come with any software? I think it does, but I've never liked their their version, and so I actually use Iris for K3CD. Is Iris free, free version? You think? There is a free version of K3CD, <coughs> and Iris is free as well. I think there's some others out there, I just haven't researched it. I'm using that imaging source, and that I like the software there. Okay, so now that you've got everything taken care of, you've got your video captured, you've got good focus, you've got good data, this is still what you see on the screen. And it's actually fairly disappointing if you're expecting to get an image like this out of it. But this image on the, on the uh, right was actually taken and processed down into the video file for here. And again, you're using free software to do this. The, the, uh, software package that most people use is called Regisec. And I'm going to go through the whole process here of how that works. A lot of people think this, they think it's magic, but it's actually fairly simple and intuitive to use. And David was making fun of me. Registack 6 is out there. I've been using 4 forever. Yeah, in fact, it's telling you that <coughs> 6 is available. Yeah, he corrects that you every time you do that. <laughs> and I've clicked that OK button for probably about two years now. So. <laughs> Let's see here. I bet you did. Where did you say that on here, David? I end up as and end up your Okay. Okay, what this is, it's opened my image file. Basically I took about a three minute video of Saturn. Uh, there's probably probably about two thousand individual frames. And what this software does, it's going to basically strip out all those individual frames and allow me to process each of them individually. But if 
makes it automatic, so you don't have to actually look at all uh, thousand frames. And so what it's going to do is the plant will drift over time, over two minutes. It will drift throughout there, so you have to manually align all those frames and stack them on top of each other. And so what you're going to do, it's going to ask you to choose an alignment point, and you can just choose an area of high contrast, select it, and then hit align. And this is actually the video that was taken. It's going through frame by frame and manually aligning each one of those points. And so at the end, it's going to give you a graph of basically the image quality and the <coughs> registration of the image, how close it was to each other or to the alignment frame that you chose at the beginning. And what I'd like to do next, I'd like to create a reference frame. It's going to grab about 50 frames of that video file and do a quick stack on there. And you can see here, it's trying to go through and do a finer alignment of those, those images. And what it's going to come back with is a single picture that has 50 files, 50 frames uh, put on top of it. And this is actually kind of where the magic happens. Over here on the left, these are called uh, wavelets. And each one of these wavelets will process different portions of the image. If you click on this, the higher the, the higher the wavelet, you can process finer detail. And while I'm, while I'm doing is just clicking holding that down, you can see it looks a little bit grainier there. The fine details, you can see more of their cloud structure. And the higher one here, you can see like the, the, the gap in the rings in the division it'll process each one of those <coughs> differently. And so really this is where you just start playing with it to get a uh, better picture. And I usually just do a quick version here. I like to crank this over on the right, especially when I'm going to take this reference frame and then realign everything to this because you can get better, better registration from frame to frame. So you need to play with it and that really clean up the image. You can overdo it and get a really grainy image. And you think you may think you'd be pulling out more details, but you, you can over process it pretty easily. So why don't you just do a quick wavelet uh, processing on it. You'll go back and you will optimize it. What it's doing now, it took the image that you processed and it's realigning all the individual frames again. <coughs> I'm thinking that one might get the impression that wavelets were uh, optical frequencies, but they're spatial frequencies. Yeah. Cone. Yeah. It, the visible structures that you can see on the planet, you can bring out more details or less details depending on how you play with those. And it's a generalization of Fourier transform. Yeah. <coughs> and now you get to choose which frame you want to use. This is a graph. The red line is your image quality. If you get some turbulence inside there, if a jet passes in front of it, your image quality is going to be rated as poor on those frames. <coughs> the green line is the uh, difference of basically the registration of your frames. So what you can do, you can throw away frames as you grab the slider. Anything above that green line, you're going to throw away. And anything to the right of this, you're going to throw away. So you can select your best frame. And that's what makes this software package so powerful. You can choose the best frame without setting it and we're looking at thousand frames. Uh, because what you did is you shoot the frames to the right of the point where the green and the red intersect. You can. It depends on how many frames you get and how well the scene, how good the scene is for the night. I typically throw away about at least 50% of my frames. And, and you can actually see the number of frames. You can limit the number of frames that you stack here. It gives you the stack size, and you can limit it manually as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see the 
That's how well the individual frames are aligned to each other. So you want it to be lower, right? And then right. quality to be high. Right. Quality high, the difference low. And then you just go back to the weight list again and play with it to, to your liking. Um, it's not magic. It's a lot of preference. Some people like their images a little bit softer. Some people like them really crisp. And it's just personal preference and uh, what the theme will give you. You can go on, there's more in here. There's actually a lot more in this. You can choose multiple alignment points, especially if you're doing lunar features. You can choose multiple alignment pictures with them. <coughs> multiple alignment points in a single frame. Uh, and there's just a ton of different options. It's just take forever to go through all of them. But there's actually some good tutorials online how to use this. Lastly, did I just set up for free or is it? It's free work. Actually, the guy, he started doing it several years ago. <coughs> he changed his interface to write a lot of the uh, software to control the camera. And he's getting money that way, but very just have to go free. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do you carve the images like that? Mm -hmm. Like from the raw to the final? Can you change a little bit of the color? The one on the left seems a little more purple. Yeah, you actually, what I'm not showing here, you can go through and do Photoshop because this one I had to color off. Like you said, it was purple, it's actually a red tint to it. And I had to do some color corrections to it. So you can use Photoshop, you can use Paint Shop Pro, uh, any of those. Brett, are you shooting with a color camera? I am. You are. And that's, that's, a, that's a good point. Uh, you have black and white cameras and that you have to buy filters for. And the color, the color, uh, Cameras for just one shot. You don't have to mess with color. So <coughs> are you using color those Philips kind of cheap cameras? Or those are those are color. The black and white ones are dedicated to astronomy cameras. I actually have a color version of the astronomy camera and the black and white version. And depending on how much time I want to mess with, if you want to mess with the filter, it's getting those in there and doing all the manual adjustments. Then the type of mood I'm in. If I want to get out there and get a quick picture. Honestly, the black and white ones, the filters are better. You know, I think you can get a better image. There's a lot of pain involved. It's a lot higher. So for a beginner, which one would you use? I would suggest color, because I've seen color cameras that are fitted. All the pictures that I have here are pretty much perfect color. And it takes patience. This is kind of my, my trek through it. This is my first image up here of Saturn with film, whenever I attach my telescope. Uh, then moving into DSLRs, webcams, and dedicated astronomy cameras. So it just takes time. Uh, you guys have to drag your equipment out every night, try it out, make mistakes, and go on. Uh, what else is out there? You can take conjunction. This is Venus going behind the moon. You can you can get that. That's a pretty tough one because Venus is so bright compared to the moon. Uh, but asteroids, I've seen people take pictures of. And satellites. That's the uh, International Space Station I took with the video camera. That's kind of actually a pain to track. I know some people have software that tracks this, but I did this manually. Basically set up the camera to take a minute or four minute video. And I'm sitting there trying to hold the telescope when it just goes across. And, and you get some pretty good results with it. And I think that's it. All right. Uh, our next up, we have uh, George Hall. We're going to go from uh, imaging planets within our solar system to imaging planets outside our solar system. Can you speak up? 
a little bit. Turn the volume up. Yeah, maybe turn the volume up a little bit. Turn the volume up a little bit. Don't worry, I'm on the mic, I'm going to see you. Okay.
so if, if you want to do this, you know, I, I've done this and I can show you a chart in a minute about where I sit in terms of being in near the center of Dallas and everything. So I'm, I'm right, I believe right down near White Rock Lake. So I'm in terrible light pollution conditions. And, uh, and you can do this, you know, even given all those circumstances. Uh, and if you want to do it, you need to, you know, we're trying to observe a, a transit of a planet that's already known and been discovered. You know, I'm not trying out there trying to discover planets. I'm just trying to observe planets that other people have discovered. You know, they've created a database here in this Czechoslovakian uh, Amateur Astronomy Society maintains a database and they put these uh, planets in it and, and information that, that tells you when the transit's going to occur and where, it, where the star is, gives you the coordinates of the star and the time of the transit and how long the transit will last amount of dimming to be, to be expected. So based on my equipment, I can I can look at this database and I can say, well, you know, this is this is one I will be able to see. And so uh, it helps me plan uh, and pick a, a, a transit to observe and plan when to do it, when to start and when to finish. Uh, this is a snapshot out of this database for tonight's transit, this is for the 27th. And you can see there's quite a list here. Some nights there's only three or four, some nights there's a longer list. This is not the entire list for tonight, but.
sometimes uh, you know I will have to if the star is too bright I'll have to uh, take shorter exposures or I'll have to use a filter to dim the star down or in some cases people have even come to the point of defocusing a little bit so if you defocus uh, the star image uh, we will not saturate as easily but what you're trying to do is you're trying to catch enough of the light to where you can do a measurement on it, but you don't want it to uh, go uh, saturate so that uh, your camera strains the, the light, the, uh, the amount of light that you can catch. So, so here's my uh, equipment here. I'll sit out in my driveway, uh, like I said, down near White Rock Lake. Kind of point from where I am with the <laughs> light pollution map. <laughs> and just so that I'm near the, well within the white area, near the center of town. And, uh, you know, I, it's in my driveway, there's a street out here, the cars go up and down, the neighbors' lights in the background. Uh, so it's not, you know, don't let uh, poor conditions deter you from trying to do this. My equipment here is I have a, a 12 inch V uh, telescope. I have an FP8 camera and I use CCD box to, to uh, control it. But, you know, I've looked in, in the research I've done and in the things I've read, people have done this with a DSLR and a, and a photography lens, you know, to piggyback on the track and scope. So you don't have to have this as this complicated a setup as I have. I, just happen to have this, so I use it. Uh, I have a DSR, but I haven't tried that yet. Um, when I, once I've collected this, you know, I'm talking like a uh, hundred images or so to cover like three hours, because it's two minutes exposures, uh, a couple times, anyhow. And so uh, I, I do a normal calibration that you would normally do for CCD images with a lot flat and dark to it, kind of uh, back out all the discrepancies caused by the telescope and the, and the camera. Uh, and then I analyze the images using some software here, this AIP for wind. And uh, this is a software package that comes with a book, it's an excellent book, and the software comes with the book. I think it's under 100 bucks. You know, I think the club has probably has the book. But they have a tool that's in the latest version of this that uh, makes facilitates what I'm doing here and makes it really uh, really straightforward. And so I don't think it's in the older version. So it's in version two of the AIP. And what it's going to do, it's going to do differential photometry. And what that is is measuring the difference in the in the uh, brightness of the stars, relative brightness of the stars within the image. So I'll show you in a minute how to do that. But uh, it measures the different magnitudes of the stars in the same image. And then the software is smart enough to step through all of those 100 images or so and output the text report that, uh, that gives the time history of the changes of the star brightness. Uh, so in processing the transit data, this is the AIP for wind. And Here's the tool that's embedded in this application. And it has uh, these panels along here that you can enter some observer information, uh, select a set of images to process, uh, do some settings, uh, define a report you want, and then hit execute, and then just steps, steps right through. Um, one of the important things in the setup that you have to do is you have to tell the software uh, how to do the measurement of the star brightness, how to do the photometry on the star. And that by doing that, you define a, uh, an aperture, which is an internal circle where the starlight is contained within. And then there's an area outside of the star that you define as this outer ring where you're going to measure the background for comparison in order to measure the brightness of the star. So once you've identified that, that will be different based on the focal length of your telescope and where you focus it and everything, but it's pretty easy to set up, you know, it's 
gives you a graph here of the star profile. I selected this star up here, and it gives me a profile of the star. And I can say, well, I set my inner ring here, and it can all the star uh, luminance, and then I can set the outer ring here where it's going to detect the background. And then once you've done that, you go and you identify the stars that you want measured. And so this is the star that's going to have the transit right here. Identify it as the B star. And then pick a couple of stars. You can pick several more stars in the image. Pick a couple of stars to also measure so that you can do the differential measurement. You can get the difference in, uh, of, the, of the brightness as this star fluctuate during the during the three hour period. So you take all of that and and uh, input it into the database and they will produce a graph uh, of the trains that your data and map a, a curve to it that essentially reflects the, the brightness of the star as it went through the transit. You can see the transit starts here here. Uh, that's a couple hours worth of data there. And what they can calculate from that there from this information is they will calculate a, uh, you know, an estimate of the, uh, the radius of the star, the radius of the planet rather. And, uh, The, um, the angle where the planet intersects the star. And you can see that it's in the, cat the catalog data and the data that was measured from my collection on the mission. Um, I've done this, I've done four of these actually, so I'm not, no real expert on this, but uh, I've enjoyed doing it. It gets quite a kick out of it, you know, because I mean, I would never would have believed that Still, it's kind of kind of surprising me. I'm able to make, you know detect a planet going around another star with my driveway. But I think you know, I've the center of Dallas. I've the presence of the quarter moon, you know, high clouds, uh, streets going by, <laughs> and cars going by on the street. And so uh, uh, the ones I've tried, you know, nothing of this, none of this has impacted it. Of course. You know, if you're really trying to push the, the limits of your equipment and you're trying to do a, an observation of a, of, a, of a very dim star and a shallow transit, uh, you probably need to go to a dark site you know, to get the best results. But you can do a lot, you know, a lot of these that happen every night in the And uh, these are a few references here. I thought of We'll post this somewhere, I presume. Yeah. 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 So uh, this is a this is a link to the database. <coughs> gives you the information about where the, uh, when the transit will occur. This is uh, a book written by Bruce Gary. It's you know 250 page book he's written on the subject. It goes into a great deal more detail than I've talked about here, and a lot more rigor uh, analytically and mathematically about what's going on. This is a link to a, a little video that they put together about how to use this tool that I talked about that does the measurement for you. That, uh, that you know, kind of makes it pretty straightforward about how to use it to get started. And then here's a link to a presentation by a guy named Ken Hose that I contacted when I first started this. And he gave me a lot of help and he pointed me to a presentation he had done for a similar group, you know, when he first started. If you're interested, looking for something to do with your uh, equipment from town, this is uh, a little different, and uh, I enjoy it. George? Yeah. You were talking about doing photometry. I mean, this is photometry is what you're doing, and you mentioned some people use filters. Do you ever use anything like Johnson filters, photometry filters, or anything like that? No. You're just using straight light, pure light, unfiltered? Right, yeah. This okay. is differential photometry. 
Okay. So, you know, I, you know, I've never done any phonometry. No, but that's a good point. So you're, you're measuring differences, not absolute measurements. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And that, that is, I understand, I would guess, guess that the other is quite a bit more difficult, you know, to get everything properly. So this is easier, really, in a way. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You know, I want to emphasize that what you've seen is what it takes to do it. It's, it's not that hard. I guess the point you were making, because of differential photometry, whether clouds are going by or anything else is irrelevant. You're, you're doing the relative difference between the stars that you selected in reference to the stars right. you Right, you know, it's a very small field of view, so, you know, you know so any gradient from the moon is probably just going to get the same on both of them. Uh, you know, like anything, uh, if you push it hard enough, You'll, you'll get into situations where uh, you'll need to be more careful. You know, if you're looking down near the horizon, I guess there are, uh, there are effects according to the atmosphere that will uh, affect different locations on your field of view a little bit. <coughs> uh, after you went through the processing on AIP for wind, yeah. was it that photometry data that gets loaded up into that check site? Exactly, yeah. It comes out with a report, and I, I made a, a comment there at the bottom, I guess I didn't cover it, but I just pull that into Excel. It's like a delimited text file, you know? Oh, the report comes back? Okay. The report that it produces, they got people we have produces a delimited text file. Okay. I can pick out the columns that I'm interested in, which is basically the time, the uh, difference in, in ma magnitude, and the error. Okay. associated with that measurement, and uh, that's what it goes into the database. Okay. And the database is, uh, you know, you just, they have a section on the website where it says, you know, fill in your user information and point me to the file, uh, and away it goes. Okay. So, very cool. George. Yes. Do you know if any of your data has been published? I mean, has, has anybody contacted you saying, hey, I want to use your data in, in a publication or no. anything? No. That would be cool. No, but, you know, uh, I think there are people watching this database, mm -hmm. looking at the data. Uh, there, you know, you know, some people have, uh, I've, I've read some articles about people have noticed patterns in it that say that the, uh, the orbit, the transits occurring at a slightly off off the timing that they should be, mm -hmm. and so that's indicated that there's another planet out there, you know, mm -hmm. that uh, is causing that, that planet to either go ahead of time or behind time. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. another thing is that uh, this Bruce Gary, in one of his in his book, he said, well, he was going to start a campaign where he would look uh, at these transiting uh, these stars that had transits and look when there wasn't supposed to be a transit because if there's another planet out there, it's a, probably a line in parallel, mm -hmm. and so he might catch a different planet, you know, mm -hmm. transiting that same star. So uh, I have actually a time or two, mm -hmm. you know, taken a look at some of the other stars in the field to look and see if I can find, just find a transit at random, you know, uh, on a star that hadn't been discovered yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Plan George, I keep going. <laughs> 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 oh, back to the rebel. So you're telling us be focused on purpose so you do not oversaturate your camera. You tell us the light pollution is the saddest band you can ever get in the city. You're not worried about weather conditions from the moon. You're not even worried about alignment as long as you get in the general right spot and your software can show you something we can't even see <laughs> when we're in a, let's say a dark site with no light whatsoever. It's just amazing that you can do that. In the worst condition you can think of. Yeah, it is. <laughs> 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 yeah, right. yeah. I think mean, that is the drive before you get it right. <laughs> well, uh, I hate to say it, but I did right the first time. <laughs> <laughs> it was, but you know, I had a lot of guidance. I had talked to people, and uh, you know, 
to the database point you just the right place. It took, it took a, a week or two, you know, after I got caught in the data the first time to figure out what it was, what, what to do with it. It's a lot of email traffic back and forth to get some help in figuring out how to get it processed and get it into a format and put it in the data.
So you're really seeing a lot more detail than, this, than what this shows these days, especially as we're approaching that maximum. <coughs> okay, so what do you need to do this? Well, first of all, you need a solar safe telescope. And, and really, when we start talking about solar observing or imaging, <coughs> the first thing we really need to talk about is safety because you can really, really hurt yourself uh, if you don't have the proper equipment or if you don't use it properly. By a solar safe telescope, I mean a telescope that's either got a filter on it or specifically designed to look at the sun. And there's a couple ways that we can do this. We can either put a filter on the front of the objective that blocks most of the light from coming into the telescope, or we can use something called a Herschel wedge, which I'll talk about in a minute, which actually siphons off most of the energy before it reaches your eyes or the camera. And then we have things like an H-alpha or a calcium telescope that does does block a lot of the energy, but it also filters down to a specific wavelength. Some of the department store telescopes are sold with a little filter, like a smoke filter that you screw on the eyepiece, which is really, really dangerous. Uh, those require that you have an aperture mask usually on the objective so that you're limiting the light actually coming into the telescope. If you don't do this, the light will focus very uh, precisely on that filter, heat it up and crack it. And I know this because that happened to me. Fortunately, I wasn't looking through the eyepiece at the time. I was a kid with a telescope, threw it on that sun filter, but I didn't put the aperture mask on. Uh, so it's really dangerous. You don't want to use the, the filters that screw up the eyepiece. It's really best to have something that blocks that energy before it even gets into the telescope. One of the other things I wanted to mention is we had some discussions earlier about hydrogen alpha filters for deep, deep space imaging that, that Phil talked about. That is a different filter than a hydrogen alpha telescope for solar. The hydrogen alpha filter for uh, deep sky imaging is really just for that. It's designed to let a lot more light in and it has a much wider band path <coughs> than what a solar filter will have. It's designed for safe solar imaging. So don't ever use hydrogen alpha filter used for deep space for solar viewing. We also need a mount. And the, the neat thing about uh, the sun and, and taking images of the sun is you can use either a, a go-to mount with tracking or, or some kind of equatorial mount if you want to track it by hand. But you can also use a manual Alpha Z mount. In fact, that full disk of the sun that I took with DSLR was a single exposure, I think maybe uh, a 30th of a second. And I just had it on, you can do it on a camera tripod or a sturdy uh, Alpha Z mount. You don't have to invest a lot of money in electronics. And then, of course, you need a camera. And I use both. I use the, uh, the DSLR if I want to take some quick images. I don't want to set up a whole lot of stuff. Or I use a webcam uh, if I want to get a more detailed image. So what can we use as a solar telescope? Uh, one of the things I started off with was a white light filter, which is which a glass filter that fits over the end of your dew shield on the telescope. And I was using a refractor, a little uh, 66 millimeter refractor. You don't really need a lot of aperture for, for solar observing or imaging. You got plenty of light coming at you. Uh, so a glass filter or even a uh, film filter will, will do the job. It blocks most of the light coming in, makes it safe for both observing and for imaging. The other thing is a Herschel wedge, and it looks a lot like a bulky diagonal that you'll have in the back of your telescope. And what it does is it has a prism in it that actually filters off most of the, the sun's light out of port on the bottom of that diagonal, and then only leaves a small percentage coming up to your eye. Now, the one thing with a Herschel wedge is that you still need to use a neutral density filter on that wedge to tone the light down even more, uh, especially for observing. Now, there's other filters that you can place in there, and some people uh, say that using the Herschel wedge really gives you a lot more detailed image because it's letting a broader spectrum of the light through than a glass filter would get on the, uh, the front of the objective. And really the Herschel wedge is designed for use with a refracting telescope and not uh, a cassegrain or other kind of reflecting telescope because of the heat buildup that you're going to get inside that tube because of the mirror. So you only really want to use that Herschel wedge with a refractor. Hydrogen Alpha, that's what I use mainly, and that's, that's kind of my favorite telescope to use. Uh, what this does is it reduces the light coming in, number one, rejects a lot of the energy coming into the scope, 
but it also reduces it to a very specific wavelength of hydrogen, around 666 nanometers, I believe. The other thing it does is it restricts the band paths uh, that you're viewing in that range to something very, very, very narrow. I think Phil was talking about uh, band passes of, I think, 13 nanometer, um, 5, 3.5 3 nanometer. Um, when we talk about hydrogen analysis telescopes, we're now talking about angstroms, which is, I think, about one ten billionth of a, uh, a meter. So it's a very, very small uh, portion of the light spectrum that you're actually looking at. And a, a, a Coronado personal tel uh, solar telescope, a PST, has a band pass of about one angstrom. You go into the solar max line, now you're looking at less than 7.7 7 angstroms. And if you do what's called double stacking, you put multiple etalons, I'll explain that in a minute, in front of your telescope, now you're probably under half an angstrom. And the, the reason you want to do this is the lower and narrower band paths that you have in your solar telescope, the more details that you're going to be able to see and be able to image. Now that comes at a price because these etalons which is the device on the front that's restricting to that band path, are very expensive to make, although they are getting cheaper. Uh, and you can get a solar telescope for, you know, new for uh, anywhere from about $1,300 to $2,000, or somewhere in, in the used range, about six or $700 for a 0.7 angstrom telescope. And the personal solar telescopes, which are great, uh, the, and around the one angstrom line, I think they run about four or 500 dollars so they're coming down in price, but they're still pretty expensive to produce. And if you figure in the cost per star that you can look at with this telescope, <laughs> 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 uh, explain to my family why uh, I needed a telescope that could only be used on one star. Uh, however, the neat thing is there's something always changing on the star. You, you can start off an observing session or an imaging session observing one thing and finish, and it's completely changed. Uh, so it's, it's really great stuff to, to <coughs> image and observe. Now the, the, the front etalon, which is the, the front part of the telescope, that restricts us down to the wavelength of hydrogen alpha that we're interested in. And then we have what's called a, a blocking filter at the back, or a trim filter, that filters out some other wavelengths down to exactly what we're looking for. Now a very similar telescope is called a calcium K wave <coughs> telescope. And while hydrogen alpha is more into the red spectrum, calcium K is more towards the blue and ultraviolet. And I don't use a calcium K, but uh, they, they can show you a lot of information about magnetic features on the sun, because in this wavelength, it's very sensitive to magnetic activity. So you can see a lot of different features in doing that kind of telescope. So what do you need for the camera? Well, one of the cameras I use is a modified webcam, and I've got an example of it here, you can come up and see it later, but it's essentially a Microsoft HD light cam webcam, and it runs about 40 or $50. And there's a bunch of people on, online that have some instructions about modifying this. And basically all it's doing is taking it out of the housing, disabling the autofocus so that you can control the focus, you don't let the camera do that. And then I put it into a part of an old diagonal so I can screw filters onto it. And then I just stick this into the blocking filter <coughs> in the solar telescope with a diagonal, hook it up to a laptop, and I can start taking those movies, kind of like Brett was showing you with webcam imaging for planetary. You can use a DSLR. A lot of the DSLRs now have a movie feature, so you can take video with the DSLR or single exposures. Uh, you can actually get some great solar exposures with just a single exposure in raw mode and then go into pro Photoshop to process that. Heck, you can even use a point and shoot. Put it up to the eyepiece. I've even taken uh, pictures with my iPhone. So, if you've got a solar telescope, you haven't invested in a camera, you know, knock yourself out. Try try different things with with even uh, an inexpensive camera. So here's a kind of a simple rig, and this shows my SolarMax 40 telescope. This is a point less than 0.7 angstrom telescope, about 40 millimeters in aperture. And you can, the etalon is up here, the tunable etalon, so you can uh, account for any kind of Doppler shifting that may be going on in the features. And then you have a blocking filter back here. It looks like a diagonal, but this is not a standard diagonal. This has actually got the filter in it. 
a uh, two times Barlow, and then my Canon XSI DSLR. How suitable? What's that? You said that the first thing you mentioned was something that was tunable. Yes, this Are Edelon. This Edelon is tunable, which means which that there's a, a device here that you control the angle of the element. So that will show you if, if you have features that are either moving away from you or moving towards mm -hmm. you, you can help tune them in to get the best mm -hmm. result. Right. Electronic or it's manual. It's manual. Uh, some telescopes have what's called a pressure tuner. They use a, a dial that increases pressure on that device to, to change the angle. This is a, a manual uh, wheel that changes the angle of that at all. Now, if I had a double stack telescope, you'd see another device kind of like this section right here tacked onto the end. But this is a single stack telescope. So what mount is that? This mount is something actually I made myself. It's a, uh, an Alte Z mount, completely manual. It's just sitting on a surveyor's tripod. Uh, just line it up, point at the sun, and you're ready to start shooting. You just need something that's reasonably stable. And if you, you can get a sh an exposure that's short enough, uh, you don't have to worry about tracking, and you still get some great detail. Uh, one thing to note, with, especially with a, a DSLR, if you want to get a full full disk image, like some of the ones I showed you earlier, you really got to use a Barlow uh, because you won't be able to reach focus, especially with this particular telescope, and I know some others uh, without the Barlow. That extends the focal point a little bit farther out so that Focus. You can get a little bit more advanced, hook up your telescope to a go-to tracking mount. And yes, I use a great Atlas, Orion Atlas mount, <laughs> just like Brett does. And uh, you can actually do your webcam imaging or DSLR imaging from that and, and have it track it over time. Some accessories. Well, shade is uh, kind of an overlooked accessory. <laughs> <laughs> but I like to set up uh, a little portable shelter or something out in the yard so that I can sit under that out of the sun because, you know, especially imaging in Dallas in July and August, this past summer, it was pretty brutal. Uh, it, it, you know, it was 105, 110 degrees. Uh, kind of made me question why I was doing the copy, but uh, there was some good, good stuff to be had cover for your laptop. One of, one of the other things that, that makes it really difficult is you, you've got all this light coming from the sun, it's hard to see the screen of your laptop to focus and to get things lined up and work with it. So a, a box or some kind of shade over your laptop really helps quite a bit. Motorized focus. This is, this is pretty big because if you have to kind of run out into the sun to change the focus, you can't see the laptop as well. So if you can Keep yourself in the shade, keep the laptop covered, and have a remote focuser controlled by motors. That's going to make it a lot easier to achieve good focus and get your imaging down. A PowerMate or a Barlow. I've actually had some really good results with the PowerMate. Uh, those tend to keep the, the, the light rays coming towards your imaging sensor a lot more parallel. I've, I've seen some better image quality coming from my PowerMate than my Barlow. Sunscreen, yeah, of course. You're going to need that if you're out there as well. Some challenging challenges. Uh, your seeing is usually pretty bad, especially compared to nighttime seeing, especially for planetary imaging, uh, because you've you've got the heating from the sun. Uh, you have atmospheric turbulence. A lot of times, your images will look like they're underwater. And usually, this, even when the seeing is good by daytime standards, it's never as good as what you'll have at night. So that's one of the reasons why when with planetary and also with solar, we take the webcam movies because if we're taking you know, 15 to 30 to 60 frames per second, hopefully a few of those frames are going to catch those moments of really good crisp seeing in amongst all of the wavering around that goes on in your image. So if you have a camera that can take uh, very high frame rates, you're not going to have to image quite as long to capture, and you're going to have a better chance of getting those crisp images. Well, it's hot, so you got to have some way to keep yourself cool and keep your equipment cool. It's hard to see the laptop. 
You know, polar alignment is uh, really tough during the day. <laughs> I, uh, I had a lot of trouble finding Polaris. <laughs> I had trouble finding it at night, but I don't know. I usually tease, tease my uncle that uh, I can see Polaris before it gets dark out of the token, and, and I won't tell him, but uh, sometimes I just make that up. <laughs> Oops, he's here. <laughs> uh, a, a good technique is if if you can polar align at night and then make some marks on your driveway or wherever you're imaging for use during the day, you can go back and put your, your telescope out there. It doesn't have to be as critical as you would for a deep sky image where you need a very long exposure, but it really helps to have it pretty accurate so that you're not constantly having to adjust the sun within your own image chip. But, well, but if you're using ultra-zoomers anyway, so that's If you're using an alpha phase E mount, it doesn't really matter. Uh, especially if it's manual, but if you're going to use a tracking mount for to take some exposures over time, you want to be as polar aligned as you can be. And of course, my neighbors think I'm nuts sitting out there in the sun with a telescope and a blanket draped draped over my head so that I can see the screen. Okay, so let me show you a little bit about uh, the focus and capture. I'm going to go back here. How are we doing on time, Joe? You're okay. Yeah. <coughs> this is a screen capture from one of my imaging sessions, and this is showing a, a program called SharpCap. And this is actually the image of the sun through that SolarMax 40 telescope. You can see me moving around, adjusting it in the mount. And I'm going to go change some settings over here to help bring up the contrast and help aid my focus. This is a live preview that we're seeing right now. And one of the things I'll do is I'll show you the saturation. This is kind of the normal color that you'll see on a color CCD um, trying to image the sun. What I usually do is turn the saturation all the way down for a couple reasons. One, I find the, the red color is a little bit distracting and it's a little easier to see the details and contrast to gain focus without that. And also, your eyes are not as sensitive to red light, so I think that kind of plays a role in, in helping you focus when that is removed. And one thing you want to make sure you don't do is focus on a dust spot on your sensor. <laughs> <laughs> that won't come out real well. Uh, SharpCap is a free application that can control your webcam for, for image capture. I really like this a lot. It's got all of the, uh, the features for uh, adjusting the image right here, so you, can, you don't have to change between windows to do that. Uh, it's free. Uh, it's free. <laughs> and it, it really does a pretty good job. So this is, it, it's also got the ability to uh, zoom in on the image so you can zoom in on the region in particular to, to gain focus. And another nice feature is it's got this reticule right here that will put out crosshairs on your, on your display so you can help track and make sure that you're staying in the right alignment. It's free. <laughs> yeah, you can use this for planetary as well. Again, hopefully not a dust spot. 
you pick out a, a sunspot or some kind of active region that has some contrast. And you can do one line of point, you can do multiple line of point. The same kind of stacking that Brett showed you earlier in alignment goes on with doing solar imagery. Now you notice this is in black and white. If I capture in, in the full color that the webcam has or the DSLR has, it's a bright red. And one of the things that I found pretty quickly is that it doesn't really look like the sun, especially when you show other people a picture of the sun and say, why is it red? Well, that's the way it looks in that telescope where we're looking at a red part of the spectrum. But it doesn't look very sun-like. So what I usually do is take it in black and white and then I'll colorize it later in Photoshop. I'll show you an example. All right, so this is a uh, screen capture in Photoshop of one of that, that active region close-up I showed you earlier. And you can see up here at the top, this is the Registax version of that image. You can see it's in black and white, and it's fairly low contrast yet, because I haven't run it through some, some techniques in Photoshop to bring out detail and bring out contrast. This, this image right here is after I've taken this one and applied some, some techniques to it and also done at least a broad spectrum colorization on it using uh, the color balance tool I pulled in Photoshop. That's a nice tool to use because you can adjust shadows, midtones, and highlights separately to give it a nice wide range of tones rather than just some, you know, just coloring it all orange or all yellow. And the last thing I like to do is put in a layer, you can kind of see this here, there's this yellow uh, color layer and it's got what's called a luminance mask on it, which I've masked off some of the brighter areas. And I lay that on top of there. It gives a little bit of a yellow layer to some of that, the brighter regions where we may have some flaring going on. And again, it just gives <coughs> the image more depth. And this is going to look a little bit more like what we think the sun should look like. So this is false color. This is false color. That's right. This is David color. False color. <laughs> false color. All right, some tips. Image in monochrome. Uh, you really, you know, if you're going to image with an H alpha telescope, it's going to come out a bright red that's not, at least to me personally, not very appealing. And I think you'll get have an image that's easier to work with if you turn down the saturation on a color camera or use a mono camera. Colorize it in Photoshop, like I just showed. A telegizmos cover works great uh, to cover your telescope and your, your CCD, uh, especially the reflective kind. Keeps a lot of the heat off, keeps things a lot cooler. One of the other things you can do is process your, surf your surface details and your prominences separately. Because your prominences, those things that are coming off the limb, they're going to be a lot dimmer than the details on the surface. So what you do, what I usually do is break those out, process them separately so that I get nice exposure and detail on those prominences, nice detail without blowing out surface detail, and then I'll merge those images together in Photoshop. Another really cool thing you can do with solar imaging, as well as planetary imaging, is do some time lapse. And that's another neat feature of SharpCat because you can set up to do an automatic time lapse, time lapse capture a frame or a series of frames every a uh, few seconds or a few minutes, whatever interval you gave, you give it. And then you can combine those later. So you capture uh, the images at intervals, combine the images in something like Movie Maker to string the still images into a movie. So instead of taking a movie that we're putting into still, a still image, we're going to go the other direction. And then you can apply some stabilization, some colorization in a program like Sony Vegas or some other kind of iMovie or something else that processes uh, movie files. I want to show you a time lapse I did of some, some prominences this past summer. And this is about, I think about 25 minutes and it loops a few times so you can kind of see the, the motion of these prominences here. So you can, you, you, if you watch this, you can actually see the, the plasma coming up and then falling down back on the surface. Mm -hmm. uh, over here, you've got some others that, that are kind of lifting off and then dissipating. It's like a burning man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a burning man. <laughs> 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 
So not, it's not only still pictures, but you can capture these sequences and really see <coughs> the changes that are happening on the surface, on the limb, all these prominences. Uh, so we really get some interesting detail. But these are all done by your that special uh, hydrogen for telescope, right? This, this is done with an H-alpha telescope, the one I showed you earlier. Yeah. Uh, this was on a tracking <coughs> because we wanted to examine, right. examine something in particular over a long period of time. And uh, this this uh, Microsoft Live Cam webcam. Do you have any sample of using a regular telescope or using filter other way around? Uh, with the white light filter? Yeah. Yeah, there's uh, one image that I have previously. I'll show that to you. That was a white light image. And, and unfortunately, that one doesn't have a lot of detail uh, because we weren't uh, really a very active point in the solar cycle. So you can see. There's one particular sunspot there. There's a lot more going on now, so you'd be able to see a lot more details now. All right, any questions? Yes? I'm sorry, can you say that? Lightning? Uh, no. Um, I'm not sure if. Is it, when, when you look at the, uh, these images, you're going to see the sun, everything else, else is black because it's filtering out so much light. I'm not sure how much would show up on this from a lightning flash in that telescope because it's in a, a very, very narrow uh, band that I, I'm not sure lightning would, would come through on that. The tube? Uh, I think it's either aluminum or, or brass. Yes. Uh, you said you process prominences differently than the rate um, and the body of the sun. How do you, what, what do you change? Well, since the prominences tend to be a, a little bit dimmer when you if you do a whole disk image, then you <coughs> have to brighten those up, adjust the levels or curves on those. And if you do do that on the entire <coughs> image, the center of the sun is going to get way too bright. So what you want to do is separate those out into two separate images process the, the prominences where you can see them and get the detail you want, and then you overlay the properly exposed body of the sun or disk of the sun on top of that. It takes a little practice because sometimes you can get an edge to that that doesn't look very natural, so you have to, to kind of work with, with the level to get it to blend. Any other questions? Yes? I've got a one photo. Yeah. Um, cool. Would you ever... Uh, uh, Take a group of people out to uh, to play with the solar scope and, and try some of the stuff out. Yeah, you know, uh, I did want to mention that uh, at our APSEG meeting in June <coughs> happens to fall on the Venus transit. I know we have some activities with TAS going on. We're actually going to do uh, some work with the Timber Glen Library out of that site during the Venus transit. So that would be a great opportunity. Yeah. Sure. Um, that would be actually a great opportunity if you wanted to come visit us at AppSig uh, to bring your solar scope. We're going to try to have a, a number of scopes set up to be able to show the public and do some imaging. And we're actually going to try to coordinate with the 3RF uh, sciences to do some live streaming on the internet. Uh, yeah, I'm looking for uh, maybe something beforehand so I, I can be more ready uh -huh. when that happens. And so once in a lifetime, I right. Be. Uh, are you a member of the TAS forum? Uh, yeah. Okay. You know, start uh, start posting your questions. And as far as an event between now and then, I, I don't know whether that would necessarily happen, but certainly post your questions, email any of us, um, join the AppSig Yahoo group, and uh, we can we can certainly help you along and help you to get it. Absolutely. So where we, you're, you are not looking at the same place that is doing astronomy, right? Right. The, the Timber Glen Library hosts the AppSig group, and that is over uh, near 190 Marsh area. And yes? Where is it? Sorry. I, I think it's uh, 190 Marsh. Midway. 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 Midway 190 area. And it's the Timber Glen Library, the Dallas Public Library System. So if you look up Timber Glen Library, you'll see the address for that. 
And it's also, you go to appstig.blogspot.com, you'll be able to see the upcoming topics and where the library is located. Sorry, those you want to show some? Uh, yeah, I'll show them